Pick up on 2020 on ID. A romantic island vacation and a dark secret revealed. This is the most beautiful place in the whole world to hear the most terrifying thing you've ever learned. I just, just walk over there, open the door, and just blast. She was a nurse, he was a surgeon, and book writer of a thriller. And now she's about to be living a thriller with him. The bullets already planted in her house. His real life target, his ex wife. Suspicion would fall immediately on, on me, my ex husband. His plot so chilling, she secretly takes out her cell phone and starts recording every single word. It'll be hard not putting six bullets in there, spitting out her. He talked about, you know, buying a gun and hiding it and how her body was going to fall. Is she going to, like, slump down and die right there? 23 minutes of menace laid out with surgical precision. Collar points, mounts around your brain. I don't know how you can listen to that recording and not realize this guy intended to kill her. This case has a little bit of everything. There's audio of what sounds like a plot. There's love, there's deception. And is there another target? I received a phone call from a gentleman wanting to use my services to locate her former girlfriend. Passport photos, 140,000 in cash, and an unexpected trip. A former Lafayette surgeon on the run. We tracked him through Kansas City area, then continuing south and west. It seems this is a guy who got away with a lot. Maybe he thought he could get away with it again. What the doctor ordered. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Lots of people keep secrets from their partners. But the woman you're about to meet could never have imagined the terrible scheme her lover had been harboring. And now she had a decision to make. Should she turn him in? But if you think the story ends there, think again. A murder plot wasn't his only secret. And that audio tape doesn't add up to an open and shut case. Was it all real or just the fantasy of an angry man? This story involves stashes of cash, a hidden life in another country, and a fugitive on the run. And as Lindsay Janis first reported in 2015, it all started in what seemed like the most unlikely of places. Welcome to Peru, Indiana. The proud 11,000 residents like to tell you about their agriculture. Favorite son, songwriter Cole Porter. Anything goes. And their curious claim of being the circus capital of the world. Well, it's a lovely small town. It's filled with very friendly people. Bruce Embry moonlights as the ringmaster at Peru's amateur circus. But in his day job, he's a city lawyer and about to be the prosecuting attorney in a big top spectacle unlike anything this town has ever hosted. I've been in this criminal justice business for 39 years. By far the most fascinating case that I've seen. A former Lafayette surgeon on the run. Detectives found a gun, a bag of clothing, and gloves. I thought I was reading a novel. I felt like this was a murder mystery. Stranger than fiction is good business for this local reporter from Indianapolis Monthly. At what point did you say, oh my gosh, this reads like a Hollywood script? The most interesting part is if he was going to murder his ex-wife, how he would do it in a strategic way, down to the detail. He is Dr. Gregory Conrad, a prominent orthopedic surgeon, earning as much as $1.7 million a year, specializing in sports medicine, broken bones, and severe trauma. And he doesn't just treat the rich. These are images of Dr. Conrath donating his time and talent to the relief efforts in Haiti. He was at the top of his game, owning as many as five homes. But he's gone through a messy divorce with the mother of his three children. And as Dr. Conrath approaches the big 5-0, he turns to the website OurTime.com for some age-appropriate romance. He was looking for the same things, looking for a serious relationship. Um, we seem to have similar things in common. Joanna is a nurse, mother, and divorcee, too. She was impressed with her knight in shining armor from the start. So tell me about your first date. What was your first impression of Dr. Conrad? 
I walked up. Um, he was standing at the bar, and so he turned around. He's a very good-looking guy. He introduced himself, and I'm pretty shy and laid back, so he did most of the talking, so I was okay with that. What did you think of him? You know, I think I instantly liked him, was attracted to him. and Charming? He's charming, so he always grabs the center of stage. Charming, bold, and according to some... A big spender. A big spender, absolutely. And a big drinker. Stephen Foch owns Peru's local watering hole, Boondocks where the doctor's orders usually called for a whole lot of vodka. He walked into our bar one night and he ordered maybe 40 shots. This went on maybe five or six times. They weren't consuming all 40 shots. They were sharing no, it around it was, the bar. It was everybody. I believe he had probably spent about $3,000 in our restaurant bar that night. He has extensive hobbies too. An avid climber, Greg Kath is one of less than 300 people to have climbed the highest point on all seven continents. When you climb a mountain, you're going to get views you would never get anywhere else. You can't drive to these kind of views. He even published a novel, The Children Are Finally Safe, an international spy thriller. This all has Joanna thinking she's hit the jackpot. He was always a gentleman. He always came down to pick me up. Lots of times he brought, you know, flowers or something. And at what point did you decide to take the relationship to the next level? We started dating in September, and then Christmas he said, I think it'd be fun living with you. And... Joanna leaves her home and job an hour away and sets out for a new life with Greg Conrath in Peru. Soon they're sharing everything, a house and a joint checking account. Did you meet friends of his? I met his mom, I met his children. We went to his children's games. Um, we sat next to his ex-wife. What did you think of her, Anna? She was nice. Greg and her got along fine. What was his relationship like with his kids? It was good. We all went out to dinner together, Anna included. Um, so we all spent a good amount of time together. So things were pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it looked as though things were going to get even better. Were you very much in love with him? I was. We looked at rings. We went to Tiffany's when we went to Chicago. She even picked out her wedding dress. Do you like to spend money? Did he spoil you? If he felt it was cool to buy an expensive purse, then he would. So a pricey trip to Puerto Rico planned by the high-flying physician 11 months into the relationship is just par for the course. It is so beautiful. The water is beautiful. The town is beautiful. Everything is just so beautiful. A romantic getaway in paradise. But Dr. Conrath is about to shatter the relaxing tropical ambiance with talk about a very twisted way he plans to sever ties with his ex-wife. This is the most beautiful place in the whole world to hear the most terrifying thing you've ever learned. He'd had a few drinks and we're on the top floor of the hotel and he starts talking about Anna. Joanna thought they had an amicable relationship, but on this day, he's talking about killing his ex-wife, Anna. I've done a lot of research on that. That's why I switched my phone, by the way, because that's the only, I used it to research it and then, I, you know, nothing is traceable, nothing. Joanna secretly reaches for her iPhone, finds the voice memo app, and hits record. An unmarked gun that has no prints. Okay. With bullets already planted in her house, which they are. Sounding callous and cold-hearted, Conrath lays out what sounds to Joanna like a carefully conceived plan to sneak into his ex-wife's house in the dead of night and shoot her, all while his children are asleep in their bedrooms. This is when the kids are in the house. The one choice is to get in the bedroom. For some reason, the kids woke up. There's lots of ways to get out. And in a chilling, matter-of-fact manner, he even talks about what will happen when the kids find mom dead. I get out of the house, I'm scot-free, but they wake up my mom. Then who, who are they going to call? Yeah. Well, ambulance, police, dad. It's I, I not something you hear about. every day. And 2020 has exclusively obtained the 23-minute recording. So detailed, it could pass for an episode of how to get away with murder. If I'm not on call, I can't bring my cell phone because that's traceable. Suspicion would fall immediately on, on me, my ex-husband. But what in the world would make the cunning Dr. Conrath want to kill? Could it be this? 
She has a million dollar life insurance policy in mind. I'm the beneficiary. The beneficiary because his ex-wife still trusts him. He would be the one to look after the kids if anything happened to her. She doesn't know it, but something might. His strategy? He would make it look like suicide. Because she shoots herself in the head. She kills herself. Do you have a gun that's not facing? Yes, it's in my garage. He has a gun at our house where we live, where he invited me to live, and he's hiding it in our garage. And I mean, my mind just cannot process that this is someone I'm in love with. I, I just can't wrap my head around the whole thing. Where is he going to go after? I mean, she shot herself, so it stays with her. I've never touched with my hands. Okay. Even when I took it to a shooting range, I wore latex gloves. After I do that, I put her prints on the bullets, close it, on the handle. He lays out his challenges. One thing I don't know is, is she gonna like slump down and die right there? That'd be ideal, but maybe she'll ride around and start making noise. And calculates his risks. I already drove over there twice. Both times, I'm happy. And now he says time is running out. Anna is planning to take the kids and move from the home she and Greg once shared in nearby Lafayette to Chicago, more than two hours away. I think the turning point when he got really, really agitated and upset was when he found out that his ex-wife had planned a garage sale at the Lafayette home. And I think it was realization that she was definitely moving. He was angry. Yes. I just couldn't register why he would be so angry about them moving because we went to Chicago all the time. And it wasn't until we went to Puerto Rico uh, that I understood um, there was a code on the garage, you know, that he knew in the Lafayette house. And in Chicago, he didn't have any access to get into the Chicago house. For Conrath, it seems the race is on. I have to, it has to be done before they move. Well, it cannot well. be done in Chicago. There's only one other voice heard on that recording, an unassuming bartender unwittingly adding fuel to the fire. Want one more, honey? I'll take one more. I'll give her one more. I'll, I'll drink it if she doesn't. You know Greg really well. You spent a year with him. Do you really think he was going to kill his ex-wife? Yes, no doubt in my mind. What do you think of this story? I think it's justice. You're wrong something to write. God gonna strike her down. Perhaps God is listening. At the end of the recording, church bell from a nearby Catholic church. The irony is not lost on Joanna. What is with that bell? It's time for church. Time for church. Saved by the bell, literally. But what's Joanna's next move? Turn the doctor's violent rant into the police? Not so fast. Even though she knew that he was serious about doing this, for her it wasn't simple. Will she go along with the plan or blow the whistle? While you're recording him, mm -hmm. you're not trying to talk him out of it. And Dr. Conrath has another surprise for Joanna. She is deeply in love with him and wants to know when she'll see him again. When we come back, Months into a whirlwind romance, Joanna and her boyfriend, Dr. Greg Conrath, are on vacation in sunny Puerto Rico. But the trauma surgeon reveals he could be planning a traumatic event of his own. Collar point, bounce around your brain. What? It's got to penetrate your skull, but not go through the other side and mess up in there. He's talking about killing his ex-wife. 23 minutes of grisly detail, all captured on a dramatic iPhone recording courtesy of his girlfriend, Joanna. What was going through your mind when you decided to press that record button? I didn't want him to kill the mother of his children. Did he act like he was confiding in you? He wanted to tell me because he wanted me to tell the police that he was home with me um, so that I would be his alibi. Conrath is so cavalier, he's even prepared to get caught. If I get caught, I can do the time. I've lived a full life. 
I'm a tough guy. While you're recording him, mm -hmm. you're not trying to talk him out of it. You're just, what, in shock? Mm -hmm. But when she finally snaps out of her shock, Joanna doesn't sound so concerned for the mother of those kids. She sounds more concerned for herself. We're going to have to start leaving the money why? Do you care about me? Yes, honey. Then what's the why for? Yeah. I'm just saying, you're going to have to help set everybody up okay. I can't set you, I wish I could set you up okay. I can't do that. And then a strange question that will even confuse Conrad. Are you crazy? Who was wanting to get married before that? And that's all thinking of you. That whole comment is thinking of you. All right, not me. It would give you something to hang on to. When you said to him, should we get married? What did you mean by that? I started asking questions because I needed to know whether it was real or not. You sounded very upset that he hadn't thought about you and, and how he was going to look after you financially. Well, of course, because I thought we were in a relationship and then I come to find out that he's made a whole plan of his life somewhere else. Somewhere else with someone else. Turns out Anna wasn't the only Mrs. Conrad. After they get divorced, he goes to Mexico. For what he says is just he needs to get away, he needs to relax. Blow um, off some steam. Blow off some steam. Uh, there was a lot of drinking involved from what he said. While he's in Mexico blowing off steam, he got married to a Mexican woman there that he met at a resort. Meet Cynthia Salazar, who lives outside Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. She's the doctor's current wife. When did you find out about the wife in Mexico? On the trip in Puerto Rico. They had been texting almost daily. Were you able to get a hold of his phone and see what they were talking about? I looked and she is deeply in love with him and she misses him and wants to know when she'll see him again. Talk about leading a double, make that triple life. Still, Joanna just wants to know where all this leaves her. So do you have a plan for me and Cynthia? Cynthia is fine. Okay, and? I'm talking to you. Nobody else knows this. Nobody. I said, do you have a plan for me and Cynthia as well? And you said Cynthia is fine. So that means she must have a plan for me too. Are you kidding me? Like that? Cynthia is fine. She doesn't need anyone to take care of her. She's got 140000 of my money. A full life, family, and stuff like that. I can't do that. Want me to wait? I don't want you to do anything. I don't need your help. I planned this out as something I would do by myself. Did he think you were going to go along with the plot at this point? I think he assumed. I think he didn't know me at all. Joanna's vacation is over. She tells Conrath she's getting another room in the hotel, but she's secretly plotting her return to Indiana. How long did it take you to get out of there? A day, and then I stayed at the airport um, until that flight. But she does one more thing before she leaves. She waits for Conrad's paycheck to clear and empties their joint checking account. You took some money out of the account. A joint account. And why did you do that? It was our money together. I had to survive. A day later, Joanna's back in Indiana and she's not taking Conrath's calls. So he calls law enforcement to check on her, telling them he fears she may be suicidal. So what did you think when that officer came to your door and said, Greg wants us to check on you, he says you're suicidal? I just figured it was part of the plot. So she tells the officer what's really going on. Did you then share the recording with her? Mm -hmm, I did. And then her partner came in and then they listened to it. Detective Sergeant Mike Rogers can't believe his ears. Couldn't this just been a guy blowing off steam, talking about his ex-wife like a lot of guys do? That's always a possibility, but I thought we needed to go a little further with the investigation. And you told me that that recording was Greg Conrad's voice, is that correct? Yes. Whether out of conscience, revenge, or fear, Conrad's confidant is now ready to spill the beans. When we return, the trauma surgeon is back from the beach and about to go into the box with Detective Rogers. What's the real life for? It's recording. Oh, all right. And has even more bombs to drop. I used a knife. I tried to stab myself and hit my heart. 
And later, Dr. Conrath on tape again. This time, ours. When we come back. Comfortable? Yeah. Joanna's just turned in her boyfriend, 49-year-old Greg Conrath, doctor and divorcee, with that incriminating recording about how he would kill his ex-wife. Police are concerned for Joanna's safety. Part of the information that he will have access to involves information that he's going to know came from you through just common sense and, and inference. So they arrange for her to live in a safe house, and meanwhile, Dr. Conrath's come back to an empty house. Detective Mike Rogers calls him in for questioning. Find out why I asked you to come here. And gets right to the point. I've uncovered some, some concerning conversation between you and Joanna about uh, you wanting to kill Anna. Okay. I'm here to get your side of the story. And Conrath is happy to spin his own yarn. There's, there's being like, you know, ranting about my ex-wife or, you know, I'm sure she does the same thing about me. Sure, we're friends. But if they're actually saying, yeah, I'm seriously, you know, thinking about somehow killing her, then yeah, that's obviously a different so, issue. Those are the things that I want to get into. I mean, I, I think we can talk until we get to a point, if you want to keep talking and then we need to get an attorney, then yeah, we have to wait and get an attorney. I, I can't afford one. I have $60 to my name right now because Joanna took all my money. And that's the first hint this successful Indiana surgeon who was once raking in $1.7 million a year has hit the skids, personally and financially. I had some issues with my wife, ex-wife, where she's going to move the kids to Chicago, and they're very unhappy about that. And I had to put myself in a bad position financially. Tell me the sources of your income if you don't mind. Basically, I make five seventy-five a year. Half of it goes to Anna, half of it goes to me. Conrath tells Rogers his ex-wife Anna cleaned him out in their divorce. Their five homes, retirement funds, stocks and bonds, she got them all. My attorneys were terrible, her attorneys were really good, um, and uh, basically lost everything to her. Couple that with a gambling problem. Conrath makes a startling admission. He once tried to do himself in. Any suicidal tendencies in your background? Oh yeah, I tried to kill myself once uh, when I was in Mexico. Mexico, where he met wife number two, Cynthia Salazar. But a new romance wasn't enough to cure what ails this dispirited doctor. I used a knife. I tried to stab myself and hit my heart, and then I tried to slit my throat and missed my carotid, which I was trying to hit. I mean, pretty bad for a surgeon. Were you becoming more convinced that this is a man planning to commit murder? More convinced. He wouldn't talk about it, the gun at all. Do you own any firearms? Does that have to do with this death threat thing? No. Just a simple question, do you own any firearms? Yeah, I want an attorney for that one. Finally, the ever-talkative Dr. Conrath realizes it's time to clam up. And as hours pass, the cops may have a motive, but still don't have a crime. Well, at this point, uh, you're free to go. Detective Rogers will search this humble rental home Conrath and Joanna were sharing. And in the garage, they hit pay dirt. This is a photograph of the garage. The gun was actually located in this bag. And we found everything he said he had laid out in that house. Prosecutor Bruce Embry says the physical evidence is a turning point in the investigation. There's a set of scrubs and a set of sweats in the area, which is what he said he was going to wear. It all added up. And what was in his ex-wife Anna's house? She found the bullets that he said he had planted in the house. How did Anna react? When she listened to the recording, read the transcript, and then discovered the bullets in her house, she was frightened. So in your opinion, he was absolutely planning to commit murder? I was convinced at that point, and I still am, that he intended to kill his ex-wife. So we charged him with attempted murder. Conrath gets a lawyer, defense attorney Eric Honeyager. The actual tape was his own words. 
and I thought there was a fairly good likelihood that the jury would convict him based on that. And to the prosecution, the case looks open and shut. A motive, a weapon, and the doctor's bone-chilling prognosis on that recording. Is she going to like Slump down and die right there. That'd be ideal. But in keeping with the spirit of this strange saga, Conrath won't stand trial because he never actually acted on his words. You decided to drop those charges. Ultimately, we had to. You had to be in the vicinity with the means to commit the murder. We couldn't get the case past the judge. There's no question that in certain other states, he could have and would have been charged with attempted murder and very likely convicted. So it looks as if the would-be killer, Dr. Conrap, is going to get off scot-free. So why is he in jail? It seems this is a guy who got away with a lot. Maybe he thought he could get away with it again. When we come back, Dr. Conrath sets his sights on Joanna. I received a phone call from a gentleman wanting to use my services to locate a former girlfriend. And I'm thinking, if you've got the contact phone number for this lady, why aren't you calling me? And puts his surgical skills to another use. Then we had a call that he had been getting passport pictures shot. He not only got passport pictures, but he asked them for a ruler, got out his driver's license and measured the size of the photograph and the driver's license. One might guess that he's going to try to find some ID someplace. Stay with us. Gregory Conrath has been caught. While on vacation, he revealed a plot to murder his ex-wife, and his girlfriend recorded it all. But Indiana law says talking about committing murder isn't a crime. So then, why is Dr. Conrath in jail? Lindsay Janice picks up the story. Miami County Jail in Peru, Indiana. The doctor's new digs. This is him, right when you arrested him the first time? Yes. 11 months later. Yes. He looks haggard. Looks like he didn't sleep in that entire 11 months. It's a different lifestyle. Dr. Greg Conrath, renowned surgeon and wealthy mountain girl, has gone from the peaks of all seven summits to rock bottom, cuffed and shackled in an Indiana county jail, and is ready to sit down face to face with 2020. One second we're on this vacation in Puerto Rico talking about marriage, and then suddenly you know, I'm arrested for attempted murder. But in a bizarre twist, it's not that infamous recording that's landed him here. He beat that rap. You have to show intent to do it, planning and preparation. That's the definition in Indiana, at least. Case law in this state looks like your best friend. Yeah. No, instead, the story of what ultimately took the doctor from green scrubs to red prison garb is a tale all its own. But to truly understand what landed him here, you have to go back to the beginning, starting with that bitter divorce with his ex-wife, Anna. She got everything. Yeah, she got everything. Did that make you angry? Sure, it made me angry. Yeah, I was very unhappy. And then we ask him to recall the vacation in the Caribbean, the night he and his girlfriend, Joanna, are tossing back lemon drops like lemonade. Take me back to that night that Joanna recorded you. How are you feeling? We're right on the beach. You know, it's vacation, so. I was drinking a fair amount, and then I just told her about this kind of, I guess, dark fantasy that I had about killing Anna. Because the person doing it's me. There's no one else that would do it. How would you describe yourself when you drink? Uh, well, I don't talk about murder every time. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to her about it before when I was drinking, and she seemed to, I don't know how you'd say, get off on it a little bit, I guess you could say. Listening to the recording, it doesn't sound like a fantasy. It sounds like a well thought through plot and motive to kill your ex-wife. It was a fantasy that I had um, and it was a detailed fantasy, yes. Do you know the difference between fantasy and reality? Yes, of course. Yeah, it's a lot of it's BS, drunken BS. But then we ask him about this part of the tape. The part when he admits he'd actually gone to his ex-wife's house, but in the 11th hour, bailed. I already drove over there twice. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking. I need to go. And both times something happens. I, I can smell it out. I mean, I, I know when things aren't going to go right. Honestly, I know that part in the recording. I never put the gun in my car and drove over there to do it. Never. No. 
No. Why did you have that gun? Well, I bought it for, you know, why you have a gun in Indiana for home protection, just to have a gun. Where did you get it? I bought it in a, some, from some guy in a parking lot. So. It's not where most people buy their guns. I don't know where most people buy their guns. At the gun store? Okay. Get a permit? And what about those bullets? On the recording, he'd said he planted them in Anna's house. Did you plant bullets, hollow point bullets in that house? No, I've had bullets from when I bought the gun in the house, and I didn't take them with me when I left the house years ago. And he says with Anna having plans to move out of that house and take the kids to Chicago, he insists his plan never even had a chance. They were no longer living in that house, so, and I couldn't, I couldn't get in the house to do it even if I wanted to, so. But just because it wouldn't have worked doesn't mean you weren't planning on doing it. Well, like I said, it's a, it's a dark fantasy to talk about. I don't know how else to say it other than that. Isn't it a terrible coincidence for you that parts of this fantasy were actually true? There was a gun, mm -hmm. latex gloves, it's a change of clothing, fun at the house, hollow yeah. point bullets at hers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. But I mean, also I'd like to say that, that all that stuff is not against the law. But Dr. Conrath made no bones about the venom he felt towards Anna. In this recording, you say that killing your ex-wife would be justice. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about the divorce, I was really on my last legs. Uh, she really stuck it to me. She didn't have to take every single thing. You hated her so much, you had a plan to kill her. And the plan, just to paraphrase, is basically for me to sneak in the house with my kids there asleep and shoot her in the head and make it look like a suicide. This is when the kids are in the house. One loud thing, uh, you know, they might wake them up and they don't know why they woke up or what's going on or anything. They go back to sleep. Why while your kids were asleep in the house? Well, the thought would be that if I could get in and out, that would be pretty solid proving that I wasn't there. It's an ugly recording. I'm, I'm embarrassed that I did it. I said those things. It's terrible. Terrible. You regret it. Well, yeah, of course I regret it. <laughs> that's why I'm here. Well, that's not really why he's here. When the attempted murder charge was dropped, Conrath was released from county jail as part of a plea deal. I thought it was reasonable at that point. I thought it was a reasonable offer. But the offer came with one very clear condition. Absolutely no contact with his ex-wife, Anna, or his former girlfriend, Joanna. A rule Conrath would violate even before his release. He did it from jail, and he used his children um, to text and try to contact me. You thought that the man that you were madly in love with and had just gone on vacation with might want to kill you as well. If he would want to do that to someone that he was married to, had children with, what do you think he wants to do with me? Once out of jail, Conrath didn't stop. Conrath tried to contact his ex-girlfriend three times after he bonded out of jail. We hired a private investigator to look for Joanna. He tried to. I received a phone call on a Saturday morning, August of last year, from a gentleman wanting to use my services to locate her former girlfriend. Dale Seward is the private investigator Conrath hired. He's got a piece of paper in there with, um, with her information, and I'm thinking, if you've got the contact phone number for this lady, why aren't you calling her? But it was yet another piece of paper Seward says that really raised flags. He'd written me a $150 check and put it in the envelope. He's got on there Conrath, and it's a $150 check, and he's got a posty note on it that says, please don't cash till Friday. You thought, how come a doctor can't write a check for 150 yeah. bucks? Yeah. The private eye quickly figured out who Conrath was and alerted the cops. I missed her. You know, I missed the relationship. I wanted to know what happened. I wanted to get some closure. But Conrath wasn't done breaking the rules. With his passport confiscated, he heads over to this local Walgreens. Then we had a call from a woman telling us that he had been in getting passport pictures shot. He not only got passport pictures, but he asked them for a ruler, got out his driver's license and measured the size of the photograph of the driver's license. One might guess that he's going to try to find some ID someplace. But Conrad has one last trick up his sleeve. The doctor is on his way for an unscheduled house call. 
He cuts his bracelet off there. And when's the next point that you pick him up? A former Lafayette surgeon on the run. We tracked him through Kansas City area, then continuing south and west through the uh, New Mexico, Arizona border. Stay with us. Gregory Conrath has evaded being prosecuted for attempted murder, but he has been ordered to have no contact with either his ex-wife or his ex-girlfriend, Joanna. Still, it didn't take long before he broke that bargain, and that's not the only thing he broke. Here again is Lindsay Janis. Dr. Greg Conrath is a man on the run. After violating no contact orders and purchasing photos for a passport he's not allowed to have, he's gone missing. My prediction was he would be in Mexico within 30 days of being released. He surprised me. He tried it in 14 days. He had a wife in Mexico and a substantial amount of money had been forwarded to her prior to his arrest. Cynthia's fine. She doesn't need anyone to take care of her. She's got 140000 of my money. The disgraced surgeon was supposed to be on home detention when he recklessly cuts off his ankle monitor and leaves it on the side of the road. A former Lafayette surgeon on the run. Conrath is traveling alone. And for a man who says he likes to fantasize, he didn't conjure up a very good escape plan. So he cuts his bracelet off there. And when's the next point that you pick him up? I start getting information that he's over around Western Illinois, Missouri area. And there's a Wendy's. Conrath's debit card pings at the fast food joint. Surely he should have known that you could track him. Yeah, you'd think so. And he uses his cell phone, which leaves a digital footprint. We track him through Kansas City area, then continuing south and west along uh, I-40 through the uh, New Mexico Arizona border. He was then arrested tonight, just a mile outside of Flagstaff. How long did it take him to get to Arizona? About two days. Another, what, half a day, and he would have been in Mexico? Probably. He had stolen a license plate and switched plates on his car. So I think that bought him some time. And he had, he'd packed for quite a while. This is what his car looked like, is that right? Yes, that's what it was found at the scene of the traffic stop along I-40. In his car, 40 pairs of shoes and just about everything he owns. Kitchen utensils, box pans. The jig is up. Conrath pleaded guilty to stalking charges and fleeing. And despite beating that attempted murder rap, he was sentenced to 10 years in state prison. He could be out in six. Getting a 10-year sentence for stalking especially doing what I did, which is very benign, is, is pretty extreme. That's, that's extreme. Sounds like you're feeling sorry for yourself. I think I was treated unfairly, yes. I think the judge and a lot of people did not forget about the attempted murder charge like he should, because it's dropped. I think that's colored the judge's uh, determination of how much time I should have as well as the prosecutor. If, if it was just a stalking charge, f doing what I did, I mean, you know, most people would go on probation for a year. Prosecutor Bruce Embry disagrees. She was attempting to find her address. Most stalkings are pretty petty, but he was stalking a woman that he had threatened to kill. And I think that's pretty, pretty serious. Perhaps Conrath got off easy. Remember his boasting on that recording? Honestly, I could suck up 30 years of jail time in Indiana. I can do the time. Still think you can do hard time? I'm actually looking forward to going to prison. It's a, it's a lot easier to do your time in prison than in a county jail. There's a lot more to do. I'm going to write another novel. I've thought about writing a sequel to the one I wrote already, or maybe something about my life. I don't know. A New York Times bestseller? More like a sad commentary. I, you know, my career as an orthopedic surgeon is ruined. Um, Never going to do that again. How do you reconcile that man doing charitable work in Haiti, operating on victims there, and the man in jail right now? What I do is I'm a doctor. I take care of people. And if I said some stupid things, then, I mean, I'm paying for it. What a thing to throw away. All that education, uh, the potential income, but he made a series of really bad decisions that have led him to 
another series of bad decisions, and here we are. Is it possible we'll never know whether he intended to kill his ex-wife? Oh, I don't think we'll ever know any more about this than we know right now. It will always be a mystery. The fallout from Dr. Conrath's misfortune leaves a trail of broken hearts. There's that other Mrs. Conrath in Mexico. What was that all about? Oh, well, a woman I met down there, and we got married. I mean, Fell in love and just got married? Yeah, pretty much. You're still married? Yes. Officially, yes. Since this happened, uh, that's been on hold. But I don't know if she's going to wait for me for five or six years. And then there's Joanna, who had wedding plans of her own. This is the dress I intended to wed Greg in, which I now call the killer dress. What was Joanna's motivation, do you think, in hoarding you? Well, that's, that's been a real stickler for me. That day, we were talking about marriage, and then two days later, she's on a flight back. You know, with this tape recording, I think she truly was thinking I was serious and truly thought she was doing the right thing. How do you go to work every day and save lives and work on patients, and then at night plan to kill someone? How do you do that? And that brings us to Anna the ex-wife and one-time target of his so-called fantasy murder plot. She declined to talk to 2020, but in perhaps the most unbelievable twist of all, Dr. Conrath confessed this. Do you still have feelings for Anna? Yeah, I think I still love her. Would you ever want to get back together with her? Um, I think it'd be good for the kids, um, but that's never going to happen. She's let me talk to him, which is great definitely keeps me going. Sounds as if the women caught in Conrath's tangled web will be entangled forever. Do you have any message to send to anybody? Just, you know, watch what you say in front of your girlfriends. As of 2016, Gregory Conrath remains in prison. His earliest scheduled release date is 2022 and his no contact order with both Anna and Joanna is still in effect. I'm John Quinones. Please join us next time for another edition of 2020 on ID.